Okay, let me start off again. Okay. So our first speaker is going to be Benjamin Ang, who has a lot of experience in IP, in copyright, and things like that. And he's going to talk about um, what's going to happen if uh, we did exactly what Aaron did um, in the Singapore context, of course. Okay, so let's just hand it over to him now. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. This is really good. I think that was a really good screening. I think it, it really resonated with a lot of us. So really thanks for organizing that. And we could have watched it alone, uh, but we chose to come together. So it does speak something about the community here. Now, what I'm going to talk about is what would happen if we tried to do what Aaron did in Singapore. And instinctively already you're thinking, man, that's not a good idea. <laughs> right? But just for the record, if you ever had the idea that you wanted to change society in Singapore, you know, but why would anybody want to do that since we live in such a perfect utopian society? <laughs> so, if you had that idea, just want to let you know what um, to watch out for. Because <laughs> The whole point is that you want to know what to watch out for, right? There are speed bumps all over and the idea is not to drive over a speed bump blindfolded. Anyway, driving blindfolded is always a bad idea, but to know that the speed bump is there. So I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, if you can't hear me on the speakers, don't worry. Your ears are still functioning properly. Uh, this, this mic is not for fun, it's for the sake of all the people on Google Hangout. And I, as I said earlier, if you're on Google Hangout and you can't hear me, please yell. <laughs> okay, right? Uh, with my background as a technology lawyer, former IT consultant, ah, yes, Jimmy, you could help me do that very important <laughs> task, which is to click. Thank you. So, uh, you can find these slides on my blog. Uh, Okay, so a bit of you know, copyright, because Jimmy first asked me to speak on copyright. And then and I went, actually it's not really a copyright issue, copyright is just the background. But I think you want to know what about copyright means is anyway. So then, what about the law against assessing data, which is actually the biggest thing that was facing Aaron Schwartz. So then we'll talk about what can police do? What are police powers? Especially this week, when the US Supreme Court actually ruled that US police cannot take your cell phone and read the data without a warrant. So that is the US Supreme Court position. But what would it be in Singapore? Stay tuned. Okay, and the last one. How could we prevent what happened? Okay, so let's go down. So copyright, uh, very briefly, I'll tell you what's one semester's worth of stuff in about two minutes. Uh, the types of works that are protected, obviously music, art, drama, and literary works. And journals, um, the research articles, although many of us might not really consider that literature, I'm sorry, <laughs> they're very educational, informative, but even though you might not consider them literature, in the traditional sense, they are protected by copyright. And what copyright prevents you from doing is to make copies. Wow, what a, what a thought. Copyright prevents you from making copies without permission. So therefore, if you're an academic and you've written an article, you own the copyright in that article. Okay, so you think. Then we go to the next slide. Who owns the copyright? You may have written an article about your favorite topic, your favorite area of research, and you own the copyright, but you can't get it published in a journal by yourself because you don't own the journal. You don't own the printing presses and you need somebody to pay for the editor, for the peer review, and getting it published and shipped out to universities all over. And that's where the publisher comes in, they'll pay for that, and in return, you hand over your soul, I mean your copyright, <laughs> in the article to them, right? And for many years, it's been considered a fair trade because if you're writing articles, you don't have access to all of these resources and you don't have access to the distribution channels. Right? Back in the old dark ages. So now, most of the time copyright is handed over and it was alluded to in the film. And this also works in Singapore. So you have journal publishers who own the copyright. So next slide. The question came up, it wasn't really touched 
in the film, but should the rights holder be the one taking action or should the police? Because in this case, if you notice, JSTOR, who is the publisher, actually withdrew. MIT didn't want to have anything to do with it. So, could the police take action? Yes, the police have the right to charge people for crimes. may be surprising, but copyright is, when infringed on a very large scale, can be a crime. Normally, it's a civil case. In a civil case, if it were just JSTOR or MIT, or in Singapore's context, a university or a publisher suing, you just have to pay damages. Could be a lot of damages. It's just money, you know? But if the police take action, then you go to jail. And jail is much more serious than paying money. So, could the police take action in Singapore? Potentially, yes. Although in Singapore context, it rarely happens. Because usually in the Singapore context, it's the rights holder who will be basically getting a private prosecution. They'll get the permission from the Attorney General and they will drive the prosecution. And that's been very effectively used by the BSA and by all the major copyright holders in, in Singapore. Very, it's a very uh, effective method of enforcing copyright by the rights holder doing it. So we don't, we rarely see the police on their own take out a IP matter. But they do have the right because on the statutes, if you violate in a very large number, and we take, talk about taking about 2 million documents, 2 million documents is usually considered a large number. So you could potentially be committing a crime. Right. Okay, so is there a law, but aside from that, let's say in Singapore, the rights holder chose not to take action and the police decided if the rights holder is not going to do it, we won't do it, which could happen. There's another problem, the law against assessing data without authority. And we have a Computer Misuse and Cybersecurity Act. This Computer Misuse and Cybersecurity Act is very similar in ways to the, to the intention of the um, computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was talked about. And what it does is that it criminalizes certain actions. The most important one is Section 3, Unauthorized Access. And you want to know what's the meaning of unauthorized? It's defined in Section 2. Access is if you alter or erase, copy or move. Oops, I see that the thing which I put noted as C, would definitely be what happened here. If you went in and you made copies, you bought a hard drive, hooked up a laptop, and you copied data, that would be access. Okay? Even if you cause it to be output on a display, that's access. Right? All these are either or, you don't have to do all. If you use it, it's considered access. So Clearly, there would be access. Now, the thing is that access alone is not a crime. Otherwise, all of us would be arrested immediately. We do this every day. The, what is a crime is unauthorized access, which is the next slide. Unauthorized is if you are not yourself entitled to control access of the kind in question. And so, do you normally have access to this? Do you normally have authority to access this? or you don't have access of the kind in question. So if you had an account, imagine now, you have an account to a publisher and you have access to articles. Do you normally have access to two million downloads? That's where the gray area is going to be. It's meant to catch situations like the next slide, where you ask yourself, can a system administrator in a company read, com read employees' emails? And the answer is yes and no. Because if the company authorizes the system administrator, yes, he can. Yes? Were privileges classified? What is the? Like, okay, so you say, um, okay, so you're saying that, like, um, there's a set of privileges, right, which some are granted and some aren't granted. Where are the set of privileges that are specified granted? Granted, Privilege. specified. Authority. You mean the authority? Right, in, in like, I don't know, um, in this case, right, reading the email message of employees, if that's not in my contract, right, and I have been served, what's stopping me from doing that? 
if you are the employee or you're a citizen? If you're an employee who is incidentally a citizen. Yeah, if you are, well, all, all citizen mean are usually employees, yes. unless they're contractors. So if you're a citizen mean, then if you're authorized by, and we look back, what's the meaning of unauthorized? You are not entitled to control access of the kind, which would be usually the employer owns the server. Then, under Singapore law, the employer would be able to authorize the sysadmin to read all the emails. Right, do I like need to like send a mail asking for explicit authorization every time I write a new shell command? No. Then how is that any different from find bar mail? Cat. Yeah, but the thing is that the sysadmin can. The sysadmin has the right. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm just reading. Yeah, the sysadmin has the right. Cool. Yes. So it's okay. But where, where if you are a sysadmin, do you have the right to if to read the email of the hot new secretary because you want to find out where she's going and you want to stalk her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have the right not to incriminate yourself when you answer this question. <laughs> so that becomes the question mark, right? Okay, what is your purpose? Okay, so that, see, it's not a simple answer in the law. And so there will be issues. Okay, so next one is, there's a case where, this actual case, Song Yik Piao, he got people to, he met people in chat rooms and said, could you please give me your password? I think I'm simplifying it a bit. So he then uses her password to chat with her friends online and to make indecent proposals. And he was arrested for unauthorized success and convicted. He was. Yeah, you were. It's inconsistent. Huh? It's a fact. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm just, saying it's, I'm just saying it's a fact. I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I'm saying it's a fact. So the next one, Mohammed Nazihan's case, where he actually got in, open, he basically got into somebody else's um, server, opened, used an open port to I get to IRC. He also installed a backdoor on SCV, now known as StarHub's FTP server, and used FTP so that the FTP server so he could access the high-speed network without paying. He also was charged with unauthorized access and also convicted. So this law has been used, and it has been used, and it's a secure conviction. Okay, what were so the sentences? What was the? What was the sentence? Um, ah, next one. Typical sentences. First time, up to 10K, prison three years. Second time, up to 20K, prison five years. And these people were sentenced to that? Yes. Uh, I, off the top of my head, it's probably something a little less than that, but not far less. These were criminal cases, right? Yeah, under the criminal law. That's your Singapore? Uh, Singapore dollars. Exchange rate now is. <laughs> I don't know. Never mind. Right? But um, so we go back. The thing is that in Mohammed Nahazahan's case, I believe each of these was a separate offense. So you can be added up. So if we go back to this offense. First time could have been potentially. If you want the exact numbers, we can chat afterwards because I'll go and check my actual records. But you can you can chalk up a few offenses, you know. And if it's a protected computer, which is basically a government controlled computer or a financial services computer or a hospital computer, the fine goes up to hundred K, prison goes up to twenty years. If you break into two hospital computers or you break into one hospital, one government, you can go up to twenty plus twenty. You go into one bank, one hospital, one government, twenty plus twenty plus twenty. See what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Security defense. Um, next. Uh, police. Communication infrastructure, banks, public services. Yeah. Does the punishment depend on whether you just broke in or what you did after breaking in or what you planned to do after breaking in? The actual sentencing will depend at the time on many circumstances. Yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, many you say, like, say 20 years for breaking in the computer, so is just the fact that you gained access to the computer enough for them to give you 20 years? The, the pure fact alone of getting access into a computer basically gets you in the door. Oh, 
Yeah. yeah. Whether whether you are, this is not the door that you want to get into. <laughs> it will get you into court. Okay. After that, whether you're sentenced, oh, we, we haven't decided whether you you'll be found guilty yet, even. Yeah. Okay. But um, if you get sentenced, it will depend on many factors. You have to show your attention. What is it? What happened? Did you accidentally go in? Were you in there at a white hat? Uh, reasons you are actually helping them to discover uh, security flaws. So those are the things which uh, will come into play when you talk about sentencing. Uh, but the max is there. That's the potential. Is there any case where uh, white hat hackers are brought into court? Um, white hat hacker cases, to my based on the research I have, are if they are not prosecuted, you don't get reported. The law only reports conviction cases, the, or not cases that are dropped. Because if there's no, if they are dropped, then you don't go to court. So there's nothing to report. Good question. What can police do when investigating a case? Well, just to let you know, under the Criminal Procedure Code, they can search and seize your computer. I should have added in one more thing. I didn't realize that they had spoken to Queen Norton as well. They can speak to your relatives, your family. If you are living um, with somebody else, they can go and search not just your room, but the other rooms. They can seize the computer. They can break encryption. They can demand passwords or demand decryption. Failure to help is obstruction. Obstruction can lead to prison. This is very, this is really a downer, right? You can even be required to provide um, real-time information. Okay? So this is all specified in the criminal procedure code. Like I said, I'm not saying that any of this is right or wrong. I'm saying that that's the way it is. It's there. Okay, so here's the problem. And in a criminal, if a criminal case happens, the fact is that it is not the prosecution's job to take care of the welfare of the accused. That's just the way the system is. In a society, the in a prosecution, the prosecutor's job is to get the conviction if they believe that the person should be convicted. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'll stop on the previous slide. Is that pre an arrest warrant or is that after an arrest warrant? Under, with, upon an arrest. Okay. Yeah. But can that be purely based on suspicion? Um, if there, thanks to the new amendments for cyber security, if the minister is convinced that there is a threat to national security, He can then order any person to assist in investigation, which then says that part of the powers may include these powers. And this was just passed last year or the year before, and nobody noticed. Right? And we all went to black out our websites for so far. <laughs> and this happened in our own backyard. Okay? So, which relates to the fact that the prosecution is not going to look after any of us if we are arrested. It's not their job. The investigators are not going to look after our welfare if any of us are arrested. That's not their job. The only people who can look after us, any of us, is us. And so, the sad thing is that some of the, the people who interviewed were saying, yeah, they felt really angry and sad that they, hadn't, they didn't know. There's a legal aid bureau. For people who don't have the resources to pay for lawyers, there's legal aid. There are also lawyers who will take on the case 
pro bono, which is for the good or without pain. The real difficulty is that the world out there, and we are in the bubble, the world outside our bubble does not know, does not understand what the Arizona case is about. A couple of people who saw my post that I was coming to this talk asked me, so what's the Aaron Swartz case about? And I just told it offhand and they said, oh yeah, he's guilty, but he should have been arrested. That's the public view. Now, if you know anybody outside the bubble, try telling them the Aaron Swartz story and see what their reaction is. They will say, oh, that's terrible. He was victimized. No, they'll say, wow, good that the police caught him. That's what the world out there thinks because they don't understand. And only we can help to basically educate and to help support any of us who is ever in a situation like that. The Samaritans, the Stutch community for people who are in depression, if we can just also just look up from our screens once in a while and see if the person whom it's sad, so many people idolized him, nobody knew that he was in pain, that he could have helped can't blame them. I mean, you only know these things in hindsight. But hopefully if we can reach out, and it's great that there's a community here, if anybody is in trouble, to reach out and help. So if it happens to you or somebody you know, I can only say, please get help. Legal help, emotional support, because if you saw all the stuff, the law in Singapore, could it happen to you? Hell yeah. Okay, so I say the good thing is that thank goodness for the folks here who are put stuff like this together. I really thank Alexander and Jimmy. This is really good because it shows that at least you care enough to be here and hopefully you care enough to help. Slides, but I suck at memory, so I'm gonna read computers off my screen like a loser. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Do it. I will. I like the haircut, by the way. Say hello world and address the world. Isn't that cool? Perfect. Ever done that? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, like, what's your name again? Was it Ben? Guy yeah. just spoke? Ben. Ben? Okay. So, uh, Ben was just talking about uh, what copyright allows, um, and I think a more important question is the extent to which copyright serves its intended purpose. Copyright developed separately in America and the United Kingdom um, through a shared goal to promote the useful scientists, to get people who, you know, were the musicians and the authors to continue making books and publishing scores. And they did this by conferring a set of rights to this. Precisely, they said they were the only people who could publish them unless they passed those rights on to other people. When technology developed to a point at which compositions could be recorded, right, and we could distribute music directly, composers and music publishers imagined their continued distribution, right, just like printing things off rather than selling compositions would destroy innovation in music, right? So um, rather than music's 
rather than musicians being paid for their compositions, right? And these being, oh, I get a microphone? Yes. That's awesome. Then you can talk to the world. Hello world. Okay, I did it properly that time. Right, okay, so uh, they figured, right? Because um, instead of selling printed music, right, they were selling recordings of this music, that this would quench innovation in the development of music, right? Um, and so they called for a ban, right? They said to their legislators, okay, so we're artists, right? And copyright is designed in such a way to, you know, promote artistic pursuit. And we're not getting any money, money from, you know, publishing your little vinyl records, right? Or piano prints or whatever. And uh, instead of the legislature proposed an alternative, they said, okay, so every time you print a record, you have to pay a fixed fee, right? to the musicians. So, you know, for one, they get incentivized to continue doing good work. And on the other hand, you know, uh, by virtue of the new medium, artists get to get their work out to more and more people, which sort of suits their purposes. The more recent ability for individuals rather than corporations to reproduce and distribute work at no cost hasn't been met with similar legislation, you know, even though it brings more reach to artists. You know, instead, you've got like nations crippling their economies through trade agreements, defending the maintenance of mechanisms that are based on shitty economics that are inapplicable to their subject and are harmful to free expression. But copyright's a target debate, and you know we've gone over this; it's irrelevant. So I'm going to talk a bit more about Aaron instead and what Aaron did. So Aaron most uh, drastically diverged from your archetype hacker in his commitment to ethics. So, you know, we have our portrait of J. Random Hacker who learns to read at three, spends her childhood in front of her computer, at some point looks up from her CRT display and everything is covered in cascading green digits. Maybe she waits so long as to graduate from college, but not soon after she's traded her graduation gowns for a robe and wizard hat and operated down to the valley to convince her friends to buy more, to see more ads. Aaron did all that, um, approximately. Aaron does all that, he hits the jackpot, and then he breaks the script. He decided, I don't want this, I want to use my magical powers for good. And you know, he tries, he wins some. One of the functions of that film was to motivate the hackers in this room guys like Thomas and Saini and Chinmay over there, to do the same, right? To abandon your well-paying job and big house and large automobile, to leverage your technical competence for the greater good of humanity. <laughs> I love that song. In um, the unlikely case it provided you momentum toward doing so, I feel compelled to argue that this is a terrible idea. Or more precisely, to communicate, I don't know how an act to enact change reliably or to change legislation reliably, and any way I can imagine you trying leads to getting hurt a lot. Let's say you're rightly dissatisfied with intellectual property law. You're unhappy living in a society in which it holds, right? And in WTA member states, there's an international baseline for this. And if you convince your policymakers to lobby for an amendment, you actually have to start a global change. But how do we do that? One way is through resistance, through civil disobedience. This is when you say, I think this law is unjust and unfair, and so I'm not going to follow it anymore. This is what I think Aaron was doing in that network closet. I think this is fundamentally effective, or at least it's in ineffective when you're the weakest of the involved parties. Throughout history, property disputes have always been solved through military means. So you say, give me your wallet. And this guy says, no. And then this guy beats this guy with a club and he takes his wallet, right? <laughs> or if not that, it's deference based on assumed military capability. Give me your wallet. No. Give me your wallet or I'll hit you with this club. OK, have my wallet. The eventual codification of law doesn't provide exception to this, though it reduces the number of disputes by way of reducing uncertainty. The general consensus that state has the most military power and will reliably employ it against any who violate its full set. Give me your wallet. 
No. Give me your wallet or I'll hit you with this club. If you hit me with this club, the lawyer will put you away for 30 years. Okay, you can keep your wallet. When Aaron writes, or at least signs his name to, the Guerrilla Ac Open Access Manifesto and declares, there is no justice in following unjust laws. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks and start to act on them. What he's saying is, individually, I think we're more powerful than the state. Law is nothing without power, and so I'll make my own. The resulting violence is predictable. If the state doesn't respond with hurt, it's recognized as selectively enforcing its own property rights. And the resulting uncertainty about what it'll allow just redirects us to our earlier condition of perpetual violence. The same is true of strikes, though I don't know how they're applicable here. And at least in Singapore, it's true of public demonstrations without a permit. But hey, you argue, if we're trying to change international law, why not stage our protests in other cities? You could. But I have a deeper criticism. Protests aren't effective because protests don't do anything. You aren't inconveniencing your target. The most useful mo model of protests I've read treats them as a degenerate remnant of strikes. Strikes actually interfere with the operations of your target. And if they don't resolve that conflict, admittedly, not necessarily through concession to your terms, they lose something. By contrast, there's no cost to ignoring protesters. You aren't getting in anyone's way. You might be able to communicate your views to your representatives, but in a democracy where there are end parties and none of the parties will work for what you want, your vote will still be based on other details. I suppose migration form is an alternative, so you say, okay, I dislike this policy, and so I'm gonna leave for a society in which the law doesn't apply. Rather than changing policy, you disappeared. But I mentioned, but as I mentioned before, the baseline for intellectual property rights are, are set by international agreements, right? And off the top of my head, there is no state outside of the WTO which is practically habitable. Where to go? I like the idea of sea setting, where we put out these networks of retrofitted vessels. And on the vessels, right, they, they, they set their own laws, right? Because there's this whole thing where, right, on the law, you don't submit to any sovereignty, right, uh, that you don't choose to, right? Um, and so um, we have this cheap prototyping environment for policy, and there's no real cost for people to migrate from one ship to another, right? You live wherever the policy treats you best, right? And so we have all of these like little startup nations optimizing for customer service, right, in their policy. Because the more people they get, right, the higher their GDP. And in that system, there is a actual incentive to change based on express preferences. But we don't have that. Um, hackers in the audience, this would be cool to work on, by the way, um, instead of this thing. Um, I'm not saying that intellectual property reform isn't a worthy cause. Copyright law, as it stands, doesn't solve any of its intended goals. It's an archaic monolith of law, maintained by entertainment giants to avoid finding a working business model. But I'm not sure how any citizen anywhere would go about enacting that reform. I don't know how to fix anything. Maybe work out a mechanism before you try. Maybe research history and find out, find out how the sausages got made before. I don't know nearly enough history, and I think maybe women's suffrage would be a place to start. I should add that I think this argument only holds for uh, existing legislation. When you have new legislation, when you have people trying to you know, submit legislation, you have two things. In the case in which you're powerful, you can enter that discussion. And in the case in which you aren't, Right? You have people, and people are vulnerable to expression of preferences in ways that organizations aren't. Sofer and Pipa killed over when thousands of state representatives got emails about why they couldn't access Wikipedia, or why they couldn't access Craigslist or Reddit. At a personal level, that was enough incentive to start taking seriously, you know, to, to seriously start investigating concerns, to think they might not be in the right. And I think you're likely to have far more luck in that case. Uh, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks.